Good evening. No, good afternoon, Charlotte Villains. Um, I'm here for one reason, that is I am a celebrity, you see. <laughs> Uh, but I'm a celebrity who's fascinated in what these guys do, and uh, I think that they're dealing with the most interesting things that you can possibly deal with. And uh, they're here to tell you about some of them today. Um, I think we should just start with Bruce. Bruce, tell us what you're doing at the moment. What are you looking at? What are you trying to find out about? Thank you, John. Uh, thinking more clearly than ever before, while your heart has stopped and there's no blood going to your brain, looking down and seeing your body on the operating table and noticing details, unexpected details that your surgeon later verifies for you. Meeting deceased loved ones, family and friends who you thought were still alive. Meeting deceased people who you don't know but later recognize from family photos. All these are things that happen in some near-death experiences that may have some bearing on the question of whether we survive death of the body, which is our topic for tonight. Is it possible that our consciousness or our mind survives bodily death? There's a wide range of human experiences that suggest this is exactly the case. Near-death experiences occur to us when we're on the threshold of death, and therefore they raise the possibility that they may teach us something about what happens after death. Now, I've been collecting and analyzing near-death experiences for more than 40 years, and I have detailed information about more than 1,000 of these cases. Each one is unique, filtered through the individual's background and personality. But there are some features that they all share in common. And some of these common features have important bearing on the question of whether we survive death and whether some part of us does, and if so, what, what part is that? One of these features that may have some bearing on the question of survival is enhanced mental functioning, thinking clearer than ever, seeing more vividly, forming more detailed memories at a time when your brain is seriously impaired. Now, how is that possible? It seems to defy common sense, and yet it happens. James was a 25-year-old nurse who got deeply depressed and decided to end his life. He took some medications from the hospital where he worked, took an overdose, and lay down on his bed expecting to die. He didn't. In fact, he became sicker and sicker, very nauseous with painful stomach cramps, and decided maybe he better call for some help. So he roused himself tried to get out of bed and get to a telephone. But by this time, the drugs had kicked in and were making him very unsteady. He had trouble standing, trouble walking. Not only that, but the drugs were making him hallucinate. And he was seeing little people all around his bed, making it hard for him to get to the telephone. At this point, he told me, he drew up out of his body and was several feet above his body and behind it, thinking very clearly. And he looked down at his body, staggering, staggering around, looking very confused. He remembered being in the body and hallucinating. But from where he was, up above, he couldn't see these little people. Now that convinced James that his mind and his body were not the same thing. And it suggests that I need to think about that also. Are they the same thing? Another feature common to NDEs that makes us question whether we survive is seeing things accurately from some visual perspective not in the body. This too defies common sense. How can you see if you're not in the body? And yet it happens. Al was a 55-year-old truck driver who went to the emergency room with irregular heartbeat. In the, opera, in the emergency room, during diagnostic testing, his heart condition deteriorated rapidly, and he was rushed to the operating room for what eventually became quadruple bypass surgery. In the middle of this operation, he felt himself rising up out of his body and floating weightless above it. He looked down and, to his surprise, saw himself there 
lying on the table with a sheet over his body. And he saw his surgeon down there looking very perplexed. And as Al described it, his surgeon was flapping his arms as if he was trying to fly. Al didn't understand that. And frankly, I didn't either. I've been working as a doctor for more than 40 years in hospitals. I've never seen a surgeon do that. I later talked to Al's doctor and asked him about this. And he acknowledged that, yes, he had done that. That where he had trained in his home country to be a surgeon, he developed this habit. When he walks into the operating room, all scrubbed in with sterile gloves on, and his residents and, and, attend, and interns, his assistants, are starting the operation, he doesn't want to risk touching something not in the sterile field with his clean hands. So he puts them where he knows they won't touch anything sterile. And then he instructs his interns, here, cut over there, pull back over there. <laughs> so what Al thought was trying to fly was just instructing his assistants on how to do the operation. Now, how did Al know this? How could he see this? This is not an isolated case. A recent survey of more than 100 near-death experiences in which people reported seeing things from an out-of-body perspective found that more than 90% were completely accurate in what they said. Another common feature that people report in NDEs is seeing deceased friends and family. Now, many of us would expect to see deceased loved ones when we die. So that's not so, not so surprising. But sometimes more surprising things happen. For example, people sometimes see deceased loved ones that they thought were still alive. Eddie was a nine-year-old boy who was hospitalized in a coma from meningitis. And he was in a coma for about 36 hours before his fever finally broke. His family were gathered around him by the bedside all night long. And finally, about 3 a.m., he opened his eyes and excitedly told his parents that he had just been to heaven. And he'd seen his dead grandfather and Auntie Rosa and Uncle Lorenzo. And then he said, and I also saw my sister Teresa, who told me I had to come back. Now, Teresa was his older sister who was in college in Vermont and as far as anyone knew, was perfectly healthy. Later that morning, when his parents went home, they immediately called the college, and they found that Teresa had, in fact, been killed in a car accident just after midnight. How did Eddie know about that? Jack was a 25-year-old electrical engineer who was hospitalized with pneumonia. One day, as his young nurse, Anita, was fluffing up his pillow, she mentioned to him that this weekend was going to be her 21st birthday, and she was going to be gone for a few days visiting her parents. Shortly after she left, Jack's condition went downhill, and he had trouble breathing. He eventually stopped breathing entirely. He then had a near-death experience in which he saw nurse Anita. Surprised to see her there, he said, what are you doing here? And she said, I've come to fluff your pillow up one more time. And I'd like you to go back and tell my parents that I love them and I'm sorry I wrecked the red sports car. When Jack recovered, he told the nurse about this experience. She started tearing up and left the room immediately. Later, Jack learned that Anita's parents had, in fact, surprised her with a red sports car for her birthday. And excited to try it out, she raced down the highway and crashed into a concrete barrier, dying instantly. Now, how could Jack know this? How could Eddie know this? How can these things happen? And finally, there are some people in near-death experiences who meet what appear to be deceased people who they don't know. Levi was a 35-year-old man who was born in Holland who had a cardiac arrest, his heart stopped, and he had a near-death experience, saw his grandmother who had died, and then saw a man who he didn't recognize, but who looked at him very lovingly. 
He didn't know who this was, didn't know what to make of it, so he didn't talk to anybody about this. Ten years later, when his, grand, when his mother was on her deathbed, she confessed to him that her husband, who had raised Levi as his father, was not, in fact, his biological father. Levi's biological father was, in fact, a Jewish man who had been captured by the Nazis when they came into town, taken to a concentration camp, and never seen again. And then his mother showed Levi a photograph of his father, which he recognized immediately as the man from his near-death experience. So we have in near-death experiences heightened mental thoughts when your brain isn't functioning. We have accurate perceptions from outside the body. We have meeting with deceased loved ones who you didn't know had died. We have deceased meetings with loved ones who you didn't know, period. And we don't have a good physical explanation for this. So all these things should make us think about, is there something about us that survives the bodily death? And if so, what is that thing? <laughs>